Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, last week we began to talk about something that I shared or I titled A People of Prophecy. Praise God. A People of Prophecy. And we had our text from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Are we good with this thing? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God spoke and said, said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Now, sometimes we've read this thing over and over again, and, and somehow it may just have lost its original meaning. When I mean the original meaning, not what you think the meaning is, but the intent of the speaker. You see, when you speak, before you say something, there is something in your heart that you want to communicate. Am I right? Am I right? Sometimes people speak and they don't communicate properly what's in their hearts. You know that, right? So someone is talking and I say, okay, so, so that's, a, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm actually saying is, eh, hey, but that's what you're saying. I know that. I remember one day, um, recently, my wife and I, we, we were ha- having a kind of argument. We're just going back and forth. Not that we're arguing. There was something she was trying to tell me. And I'll just jump into the conclusion of it. So I'm like, yes, I know that's what she said. No, you're not getting what I'm saying. I said, I get I was acting like the more intelligent one. You know, like, you don't need to say many words. I can see where you're going. And then she was like, no, you're not getting me. I said, what else are you trying to communicate? Is it not this? Is it not this? Say yes, it's not this. <laughs> That's what I'm like, no, you're not getting me. We kept over five minutes. Then I paused. I'm like, okay, hold on. What are you saying? Then she began to explain and explain. I said, oh. So I was thinking she was going somewhere. Are you getting what I'm saying? But she was going elsewhere. Now she was talking, but then she was not really communicating to me. Now, for two reasons. Now, she was not communicating the way I understand things. Are, are you, are you going to understand what I'm saying? She was communicating the way she understands things. You understand what I'm talking about? Or sometimes, you know, has generally, they say, when a lady gives you a description, you better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> when you say, give me the description of a place, and say, then, when you keep coming, you just, you, you land in Kubwa. <laughs> you know, now, I'm not saying that for all ladies, you understand what I'm saying? But I said general, you know, that's what people say. You know, now, the person is, it's not like the person de- determined to confuse you. The person was sincere. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, say, when you come, you know, reach the first bus stop, and then you now see, and then you go this way, and then you go that way. And by the time you say, say, hold on, you should have just told me that there is this junction. Because the way you think is different from the way the person thinks. Now, the person is trying to describe the place for you, thinking you will get lost. But you are trying to understand the description of like someone who knows anywhere he goes to. I <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So the items the person is using to describe for you are not things that you're used to in description of a place. You are used to tell me the name of the street. Just tell me the name of the street. I know how to get there. Say, no, 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 you don't understand. When you, you have to drive, you know, you drive four die bits. Now, that four die bits, it might just be like 50 meters. But the way it's described, you go four die bits, you think four die bit might be like 500 meters. <laughs> I, you understand what I'm saying? So now back to this, this um, word that God spoke. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, if you don't understand what his image is, if you don't understand what his likeness is, you will not understand what he just said in this place. But when you understand his image and his likeness, you will now understand how heavy this statement is. Let us make man. You wonder, wait, Lord, how, what audacity from God to believe so much that man, are you, are you following me? That man can be in his image. I call it audacity because this is, this is something outside of God. And he believed so much that this thing is possible. 
You listen to what I'm saying? He didn't say, let us make man to be man. He said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, what has fooled a lot of people is to look at Adam and think that, okay, that means God might be like four, four, um, maybe God might be five foot tall or things like that. That's what people have think. But you don't understand that the man Adam was not the one that God was talking about. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Adam was not the one God was talking about. Now, last week, I told you about the Godhead when we went to 1 John chapter 5. Um, chapter 5 and verse 7. It says there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And it says these three are one. And I described that to you. I said the Father is never seen. You don't see the Father. You will never see the Father. You will never see the Holy Spirit. Are you get what I'm saying? The only person of the Godhead that is seeable is the word and that's because the word becomes flesh praise God and in the day the word became flesh he didn't show up as one um, one funny looking creature and you understand what I'm saying from the first time the word became flesh he never showed up as a funny looking creature he showed up as a human being so much so that you cannot differentiate him from every other human being. Praise God. So Melchizedek showed up in the Old Testament. Now he showed up, so he, was, he looked so normal that it was believed he was a physical king that ruled in their day. So there are people who say Melchizedek was a king. You know, he, in, in Genesis, he's called the king of Salem, the king of um, the king of Salam, a place called Salam, right? Now, so people now say that must have been old Jerusalem. The name was Salem before it now became Jerusalem. Now, they have all these funny ideas just to prove that. But then, truly speaking, it is just possible in the days of Abraham, they actually felt that Melchizedek was a physical thing. But now the problem is this. And, and that's why when you study old writings, it's, it's very important you study these things. The, the problem now is, later on, you know, somebody comes to you and says, oh, I met a man who lives on the next street, you know, he introduced himself as Mr. Chan. Very nice man. He helped me. He did this for me. And he did this for me. He said, ah, really? Wow. He said his name is what? Mr. Chan. He lives on the next street. Yeah. In fact, he even pointed his house to me. So now you just carry this assumption that there is a Mr. Chan that is living on the next street, right? So you go, you tell everybody, oh, there's one Mr. Chan that lives on near our house. Are you, are you listening to me? There's one Mr. Chan that lives near our house. He, he's a nice man. He helped my sister. Oh, no, no. And then you keep on and you keep on. And you, do you know you can carry that on for like several months? And then one day, someone takes the chance to go look for this Mr. Chan. And then he goes and, and, and checks. They said the next street. So you start asking. And then you ask from the beginning of the street to the end of the street, is there any Mr. Chan in this place who's like this? And everybody tells you no. And now you're wondering. And then you come back and say, sorry. Can we go look for that man you spoke about? You, both of you go. You don't find him. And that's the day you realize that something is not right. Now, the easiest route for you to take, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. The easiest route for you to take is to say that maybe he lied to me. But you may just not understand that you met an angel of God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Most times, even when you meet an angel, they will not tell you straight that I'm an angel. Look through the scriptures. They won't tell you straight that, oh, I'm an angel. Very few times. And it depends on the assignment. Like when they came to Mary. That one was clear. I came with a message to deliver to you. And you understand what I'm saying? I didn't come to help you. I came to deliver a message to you. So to give authenticity to the message, he has to introduce himself as someone who came from heaven. Are you getting what I'm saying? 
Are you understanding what I'm saying? But then you read about Samson, the birth of Samson. So an angel met the mother of Samson. I said, hey, woman, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Listen, you're going to have a son. And this is what's going to happen. This is how you treat the son. And this is how you treat the son. Like, thank you so much. Oh. And then, you know, she's wondering. And like, thank you. Then like, let me go get my husband. And then she went to her husband and said, ah, I met a man of God who told me. Now, that's what she said. I met a man of God who told me this and this and this. And said, ah, can we go and look for him? And he said, look, let him come and tell me. So they prayed. And then they went. The man came again. I said, hey, I'm sure that angel must have gone to heaven and must have been told that you didn't do it the proper way. How can you go and just tell the wife and you don't tell the husband? <laughs> go back and do the proper thing. Are you getting what I'm saying? So the angel had to come back. And when he came back, he met the woman again. He said, hold on, hold on. My husband is not far. Let me quickly. He waited. And then the husband came and said, hey, are you the man of God? He said, yes, so what, 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 how do we treat that? I want to know. And then he began to explain to them. And he said, ah. While he was explaining, you know, the woman was like, amen, amen. But the man is thinking, I've never seen this face before. Where is this person from? He had all those questions in his mind. So later, when the guy finished, he said, sorry, um, what's your name? So that when your prophecy comes to pass, we will know you to do you honor. So we can say, oh, the man of God, so that we'll bring our friends, you know, to come and they have problems too. You know how these things work. And I said, ah, sorry, I can't tell you my name because it is a secret. That's what the angel said. He said, I can't tell you my name because it's a secret. And I said, okay, let's give you an offering. He said, no, if you want to give an offering, give an offering to God. So they say, okay. And then they arrange an altar and put the offering. The moment they put the offering, this angel, because he knew he cannot receive the offering, lit up the offering unto God. And the Bible says he did a wonder in their midst. Entered the offering and disappeared. And that's when they realized that this was not a human being that came. What am I saying to you? There are several encounters people have had with God. Some of it they did not know. Some they knew. Now Abraham had so many encounters with God. Not he had encounters in his dreams. He also had encounters with the appearing of God physically to him. Abraham was very used to that. That God will appear to him. See, praise God. He was very used to that. So Melchizedek was one of those appearances. And God showed up. This time he showed up as a priest. And he introduced himself as a priest. Because he came. He said, you need to understand this. He came to receive an offering from Abraham. That's why he came. Are you following me? That's why he came. Two things. He came to receive an offering from Abraham. And number two, he came to bless Abraham. Before now, God had been saying, I will bless you. And you understand what I'm saying? Abraham will have a dream. And God says, Abraham, I will bless you. I will make you great. All those things were in a dream. But to make that blessing legal, it has to be proclaimed by a voice on the earth. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So God had to show up in human form. And says, Abraham, let's do something. Let's cut a covenant. And this is the covenant that we're going to cut. You will give a tenth of everything. Then I will be your sustainer. And that's how Titan began. Are you hearing? That's how Titan began. It began with a covenant. God says, I want to be the one to sustain. So this is how it's going to work. You are going to give a tenth of everything you have. You will give it. Then I will take responsibility of sustaining. And Abraham understood that very well. So immediately he counted and took out a tenth of all the things he had. And he gave it to Melchizedek. Now, okay, so what did Melchizedek do with it? He didn't take it away. 
if you read the story, when Abraham met the king of Sodom, he made a statement. When the king said, you can take everything, the king said, no. Abraham said, no, I cannot take because I have sworn before the Lord that I will not take even a shoelace from you. Now, when did he swear before the Lord? He was referring to Melchizedek. And you understand what I'm saying? He was referring to Melchizedek. And then, he says, I will not take a shoelace from you. Only what the servants have eaten. And the portion that belongs to, he mentions several people, that there are portions that belongs to them. He says, accept that. Now, what you don't understand is, when Abraham gave Melchizedek the tithe, Melchizedek told him what he should do with it. He didn't gather all those sheep and clothes and things and carry them away. No, he didn't. Because he went back to heaven, you know that. No. So he didn't carry them. He told Abraham, give this portion to this one. Give this portion to this. Give this portion to this. Are you following what I'm saying? So when Abraham met the king of... Now, he couldn't tell the king of Sodom that he paid tithes. The guy will not understand. Because this is something new. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So he said, he just told him what happened. And then he left. But remember, God was on a journey. A journey to bless men. Concerning the tithe, let me just chip this in. When God started that covenant with Abraham, right? It was not just to end with Abraham. I hear sometimes people say a lot of funny things. People say things like, oh, Abraham paid tithe only once. And I've heard pastors actually argue that Melchizedek was a human being. So Abraham paid his tithe to a man, a king. He was just paying homage. They tried to downplay tithing. So they say Abraham was just paying homage to a king. But they don't understand this part. Now Abraham taught his son Isaac. Are you getting what I'm saying? And then we get to his grandson, Jacob. Here is Jacob, left home and with nothing. He got to that place, wondering what would become of his life. And something happened. He had a vision. And in that vision, God appeared to him. And God spoke to him and said, I will bless you. And I will make you great. And God introduced himself as the God of his father, Abraham. Are you listening to me? So when, I, when Jacob woke up from that sleep, it was a dream. When Jacob woke up from that sleep, he knew that this was not a normal dream. So he decided that he was going to take a step. And he made a covenant with God and said, if you will bless me like you have said. If you will do these things that you have said, then you will be a God to me. And everything you give to me, take notes. He said what? Everything you give to me, I will give a tenth to you. Number one, he said, Everything. Who taught him that? Are you understand what I'm saying? Who taught him that? That you tithe everything. Secondly, he said he will give it to God. He didn't say he will give it to an earthly king. He will give it to God. So it was a known fact that you tithe to God, not a human being. Are you understand what I'm saying? That's what he was trained to know. So the day he encountered God, he took advantage to make that covenant. He says, everything you bless me with, I will give a tenth of it to you. Now what was God doing? He was securing the blessing for all generations. Because he told Abraham, so he says, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Praise God. Now then, so God made this statement that 
Let's make man in our image and after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the cattle and over every creeping thing on the earth. That was the intention of God. And then he formed Adam. I told you last week, Adam was not in the image and likeness of God. The reason is very simple. God is a spirit, right? God is a spirit, but Adam was not a spirit. Adam was a living soul. A living soul is not the same as a spirit. You need to understand that. And number two, God is a spirit. Man was flesh. Now give me Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 3. <clears throat> and the Lord said, what did the Lord say? My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is what? Flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. Now, I know people have used this scripture to say God put a mark for man, that man can only live 120 years. But that's not what God said. I get, I get what I'm saying. That's not what God said in this place. What God actually said was the earth, man as is in existence now, have 120 years to live before I destroy them. Are you getting what I'm saying? He didn't put a mark. So, because a lot of people have believed this to say, look, so when you want to think of long life, the farthest you can imagine is 120. If I get to 120, I have reached the mark that God said. No, God never put a mark to our age to say 120. No, he didn't. Praise God. He didn't. He just said, in 120 years, I will destroy the earth. And that's exactly what happened. Noah's flood came 120 years from when God made this statement. Are you following me? Are you following me? But here's what, when God declared that man is flesh. And God declared that he is spirit. So we can't flow together. That's because the intention of God right from the Garden of Eden was to make man a spirit being. So he had two trees that he planted in that garden. One is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then the second tree is the tree of life. And I explained to you last week that that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was a normal tree. The Bible said it. Look at it. Um, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Um, let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. Verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now it says out of the ground, right? So this, this trees, all these trees grew out from the ground. Are you following me? They grew out from the ground. And then secondly, in chapter 3, when the serpent tempted Eve, here's what happened. Verse chapter 3 and verse 6. Chapter 3 and verse 6. Now, and when the woman saw that the tree was what? Good for food. Did you see that? When she saw that the tree was good for food. Now, you want to question all this while, what was she thinking about the tree? You know, there's a way you make a mystery out of something. And people's minds are just in line with what you have made them feel about that thing. Until one day they say, come, this thing is just a normal <laughs> You know, in those days, in, 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 in some villages, you have a tree that will tell you that the tree used to talk. <laughs> How many of you have heard things like that before? They say, this tree used to talk. Or if you cut this tree, blood will come out. And you believe that in so much, to the extent that you'll see blood on the tree. And you understand what I'm saying? But one day, you now grow up and start asking yourself a question, but who don't know? 
How can three bring out blood? So do not know it's an ancient tree. You don't know how many people that they are buried inside this tree. It's a spirit living in the tree. But you believe all those things until one day you're bold enough to say, let me cut this tree and see. And nothing, just, that's the day you demystify the tree. But what happened first? You look at that tree again and say, this is a normal tree. That's what happened to Eve. So God said, Adam had told her, you can't touch this tree. This tree is special. God said, this tree, ah. So every time she's moving around the tree, she just, ah, I don't want trouble. When the devil now came and began to educate her mind, she now looked at the tree again and said, oh, wait, till this tree has fruits. It's no matter so what's the difference between this one and the mango tree I ate yesterday. And she looked at it like, now that's how she got tempted. And she took it and ate. And then she called her husband and said, honey, I think there's something you're missing. Now, the Bible just says she gave it to her husband and he ate as though she remote controlled him. Say, I have eaten it, you take and eat it. You don't know the conversation that took place before Adam accepted to eat with her. I don't, I don't get what I'm saying. Honey, see, this tree, I think you're, thinking, you're not getting this thing. Maybe you don't even understand what God said. No, God said we should not eat it. Adam, I've eaten it. Nothing happened to me. See? <laughs> I get what I'm saying. And then Adam too, like, so why did God say I should not eat it? See, my wife has eaten it. She didn't die. She didn't drop dead. <sighs> Maybe I don't understand God truly. And then he took it too, and he ate. And I told you that after they ate that tree, nothing happened to them. They didn't now know good and evil. They didn't. Praise God. This was the same Satan that looked at them and said, you are now naked. He said, and we know we are naked. So you see, fools, what I mean is, see, you should be ashamed because you are naked. Why should we be ashamed? He gave them a different interpretation of what it is to be naked, and they believed him. So God shows up. Adam, where are you? We hid ourselves because we are naked. God didn't say, how did you become naked? What did God say? Who Hold you naked. So they said to God what God did not tell them. So God said, who told you that? Praise God. And then I told you last week, I said the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was just a normal tree. And the truth concerning that tree was this. Why did God make it a tree? One day, according to God's plan, God would have visited them physically and they would have sat by that tree and made a feast are you listening to me they would have made a feast because they have kept the obedience of god and on that day god would have given adam and eve the holy spirit because no tree can make you no good and evil the only person that makes you no good and evil is who the holy spirit and that was the same thing jesus did when he came to the earth. He came the same way. Because, you see, that's why the Bible called him the second Adam. Are you listening? Are you listening? He's called the second Adam. So God had to start again what he wanted to do in the Garden of Eden. So in the Garden of Eden, he was instructing them and instructing them, trusting that they will obey him. Then he will give them the ability to know good and evil. But they, they, miss, they messed things up. So Jesus came picked his disciples and he began to teach them and instruct them, teach them and instruct them. And he spent three and a half years with them. And when he was done, he said, guys, I'm leaving. But wait, don't do anything. Why did you tell them not to do anything? Because they needed to be able to judge between good and evil, right? He says, don't do anything until the Holy Spirit comes. And they obeyed him. They stayed. They waited until the Holy Spirit came. Praise God. It was the coming of the Holy Spirit that made them, because number one, he empowered them. Now they can discern. Are you listening to me? They can discern. So even the Bible tells us that we will judge angels. How do we have the ability to judge angels? Because we have the spirits to discern good and evil. And good and evil is not about the earthly things. When God speaks, God is not speaking of earthly things. God speaks of eternity. 
Every word God utters, he utters from eternity. So that's why many times we don't understand God. God is speaking of eternity we are looking at. So God, God comes to you, look at you now. You're living in one room, self-contained. Huh? And then that room, self, your bed is in one corner. And God comes and says, my daughter, I will move you forward. And when you hear God says, I will move you forward, you're thinking, ah, maybe God wants to move me to a two-bedroom apartment. That's all you can think about. Because you're using where you are now to judge your life. And do you know the truth? You can actually move to a two-bedroom apartment and you are so excited that God's word have come to pass. Do you know, last year, God told me he's moving me forward. Brethren, guess what? Now, I was there and God spoke to me. I was in a self contained Now, I live in a two-bedroom flat. Praise the Lord. But you don't realize that what God was talking to you about was far beyond the physical house. You don't realize that. So you stay there, you limit yourself, and you think life is okay for you now. And one day God will show up and says, hey, there is a word I gave to you. And you didn't take it seriously. You say, which word, Lord? I said, I'm moving you forward. Hey, Lord, we move forward now. Say, we enter two bedroom flat. Say, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm talking about heights that I want to take you to. That's the day like Abraham, you will fall before him. I say, Lord, have mercy on me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the character of the Holy Spirit is that which makes us no good and evil. But a lot of God's children have not functioned clearly with the Holy Spirit on this. We love the Holy Spirit. He gives us the ability to speak in tongues. We love the Holy Spirit. He gives us the ability to do miracles. We love him for that. But the one thing that God intends for the Holy Spirit to do in your life is to give you the ability to be able to judge. Make the right decisions. Why is God so concerned about making right decisions? Because everything on earth, everything about life has clearly been written. There is nothing that is happening new that is not in the plan of God. Are you listening to me? Give me Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, For we are his what? Workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good work, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Give me the amplified. Give me the amplified quickly. Look at it. It says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking parts which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Did you see that? Before you were born, the life you are supposed to live has been predetermined by God. Are you getting what I'm saying? It has already been predetermined before you were born. Can I tell you something? The day God formed man was the same day he set the agenda for your life. That was the day he set the agenda for your life. But guess what? And, and hey, he says it's a good life, not a hard life. Not a life that demons will be chasing you up and down. Or you will be chasing demons up and down. He says, what? Living the good life, which he prearranged. Now, here's the problem. God has planned this thing out. He has prearranged all this thing. But here is the issue. 
man that is supposed to live that life does not have the ability to know good and evil. So man accepts everything that comes his way. I said, maybe that's the will of God. Are you get what I'm saying? Maybe that's the will of God. Now, that's what God wanted to solve from the very beginning. Give you the ability to see what is good in every situation. To see what is bad in every situation. So you have an offer between A and B. How do I know the one that is good? And sometimes the one that appears good may just not be the good one. So how do you tell? There are people who have made choices where marriage is concerned based on what they see. They say, ah, you no, know, Pastor, there are, there are two people that are asking me my hand in marriage. Okay, so what's it? Ah, Pastor, one works with Shell. He's, he goes to church. You know, he's, he's correct. Everything he just correct about. He has a master's degree and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what's the other one? And the other one, eh, Pastor, you know him. He's a brother in church. So what's wrong with him? Hey, Pastor, uh, uh, he just, he's, he's okay. It's not like he's not okay. He's, he's a very spiritual brother. Uh, but, uh, so what's the problem? Well, Pastor, he, he's coming up. <laughs> so what do you mean he's coming up? Uh, he's into, you know, he's, uh, the job he's doing now. Uh, so what's wrong with the job? Uh, he's, he's, it's not like he has money. He doesn't have money like that. That uh, but, you know, the woman went out. He told me he was taking me out. Me, I was having high hope. Next thing, that took me to, uh, what they call that place? Chicken Republic. And he not even said that they should give that their special. <laughs> because that's what I'm talking about, you know. Uh, the other one, he took me to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what's your problem with that, hey, Pastor? You know, you know, they say, I know, it's not like I'm after money, you know, but they say it's good to be crying in a BMW. <laughs> <laughs> and to be trekking and crying. <laughs> you know, I put have that mentality. <laughs> so, uh, there will be a cry. <laughs> so, it's better you cry inside a BMW than you cry trekking. <laughs> Praise God. And so they've taken that decision. Let me go with this one that ah, my family problems are plenty. <laughs> At least this one can help me solve some of it. And they went with that one. And two years into the marriage, the oil company said, we can't handle you anymore. Or something happened. There's a setup in the office. Are you getting what I'm saying? There's a setup in the office. He's thrown out of office and so bad that he cannot get a good job again because his name has been sold. Then you now wonder, what did I enter? And meanwhile, bro, that is coming up, have now come up. <laughs> because he was coming up. Now he has come up. And then you see the bro, and you feel ashamed of yourself. What happened to you? You didn't know what was good. You didn't know the path, paths that God has set for you. You couldn't discern it. You couldn't see it. And let me tell you the truth. See, read, give us Proverbs chapter 8. We've done this before, but I want to show you again. Give me Proverbs chapter 8. New King James. From verse 1. It says, does not wisdom cry? Now, where you see wisdom here is referring to the Holy Spirit. This is the character of the Holy Spirit. He said, does not wisdom cry and understand and lift up her voice. Next verse. She takes her stand on the top of the high hill beside the way where two paths meet. You see, the Holy Spirit takes her stand where? On top of the high hill. Beside the way where two paths meet. Well, that place is called where two paths meet is where you make decisions. And you understand what I'm saying? He said, You'll find the Holy Spirit there. What is it doing where two paths meet? To show you the good way and the bad way. That's what he's doing there. He said, He's there. He's there. What's he doing there? He's crying, Hey, 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 I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. 
That's what he's doing. Next verse. She cries out by the gates. Where you're entering, she stands by the gates and she's crying out. Hey, hey, don't go there. Oh, hey, go there like this. She says, she's crying out at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. She's there. So the Holy Spirit is there at the entrance of every door. Why is it at the entrance of the city? To teach you the good and the bad of the city. Why is it at the entrance of the door? To tell you how to behave yourself in this place that you're entering. The good and the bad. That's his work. Next verse. To you, O man, to you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. My voice is not to the trees. My voice is not to the mountains. My voice is to who? The sons of men. Because right from the beginning, God have determined. You see, that's why when you read down, you see where it says, look, I was, I was with God when he created everything. Maybe we should just be reading. I love to read this chapter. Please follow me. Follow me and, and, and may God give you understanding. Next verse. Next verse. Oh, you simple ones, understand prudence. And you fools, be of an understanding heart. Come on, quickly. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things. And from the opening of my lips will come right things. Now you see what God planned for them in that tree of knowledge of good and evil. This was the agenda of God right from time. Next verse. For my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. So what I tell you, I'm not telling you with an agenda. Everything he's saying here is a knowledge of good and evil. Next verse. They are all plain to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Understand what he's saying. He said, when I speak, my words are plain. My words are plain. There are times, listen, Abraham, for example, was told, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and go and offer him up on one of the mountains of Moriah. Now, naturally speaking, that's a no-no. I listen, how can somebody son you have waited for for how many years now you've gotten it and then a voice is telling you go and sacrifice that son it's a no no but guess what abraham didn't just wake up and carry the son abraham contemplated on the matter and came to a conclusion how did abraham come to conclusion wisdom was in operation the holy spirit was there to help him are you understanding what i'm saying the Holy Spirit was there to help him. Say, Abraham, the God who's telling you to do this thing, do you know he has the ability to raise the dead? Ah, that's it. That's it. That makes sense now. But do you know even to a normal human being, it still doesn't make sense. Now, here is Abraham, matching with confidence. Are you, are you listening to me? Marching with confidence to go and sacrifice his son. What was the confidence in his heart? God have told me. Now notice what he says. They are all plain to him who understands. They are plain. And right to those who find knowledge. So here is Abraham. Marching. And I, Abraham, what are you thinking? He said, no, God told me that in Isaac shall my seed be. And God, when Isaac was born, told me to send Ishmael away. And I obeyed him. Meaning, every prophecy he has spoken to me about, it is from Isaac that is going to continue. Now, this same God is telling me to go and sacrifice this Isaac. If all these things God have said is true, then I'm not supposed to lose Isaac. There has to be an Isaac following the prophecies that God have given to me. So why is he now telling me to go and sacrifice? I'm sure he's the one telling me to go and sacrifice him. The reason can only be this. He wants to show me the power of resurrection. 
They are plain to him who understands. Abraham understood and he was marching up. Are you listening to me? It's the same way. I remember many years ago, I was still in school then. You know, the, the whole fellowship had come together and they bought me um, electronics, TV, video then, VHS, video then, and I think several things. They had bought several things for me. And I was glad and thanking God. After a while, not so long, maybe one or two months, maybe not up to two months, I heard the Lord say to me, he says, so everything. I said, oh, it's not fair now. He said, I want you to sow everything here. And he told me who to give it to. I said, ah. So, as I contemplating on it, I'm like, okay, how do I, how do I, now, sincerely speaking, the problem was not to give it out. That I was already used to. But the problem was that all these people got this thing from me. Then the Holy Spirit began to explain to me. And when he was done explaining to me, God is my witness, I heard a choir behind me just up over my head. And they were just singing that song. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy with Jesus but to trust. I heard that. I, it followed me everywhere I went to. I was just hearing it. I was just hearing it. I was just hearing it. I said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. I, I was still hearing it. I entered the room, packed everything, put them properly, called the person. They come and carry. They are all plain to him who understands. Are you listening to me? They are plain to him who understands. Next verse. So someone comes to you and says, how would you just give out everything like that? Are you okay? Are you out of your mind? I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Receive my instruction and not silver. How can he boldly tell you this? He said, take my instruction. Don't take money. Don't take money. Receive my instruction, not silver. <laughs> and knowledge, rather than choice good. Knowledge, there it says, receive knowledge from me. Receive my knowledge, rather than choice good. So if you have the choice to make between going for gold and going for the knowledge of God, he said, go for the knowledge of God. That's why it says, go for the knowledge of God. Receive my instruction and not silver. Brothers and sisters, see, the Holy Spirit has been given to us. And his job, his assignment is to help us to tell what is good and what is evil. Are you listening to me? And trust me, at every point of decision, the Holy Spirit is right there. There is no point of decision you get to that you will not find him. But many, though he's there, many ignore him. And they make decisions based on what they can relate with. You make a decision between for example, you get a job offer and you're told, oh, we'll pay you $5,000 every month. So that offer is there. But there is another instruction. Start a business by yourself. And then you look, $5,000, you're calculating what the first salary will do for you. Start a business. You're calculating, I have to first of all think of how to raise the capital. And you understand what I'm saying? That's a decision point. That's a junction you have gotten to. And the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you. Look, if you join this company, they will take your time. 
you will not have time to do any other thing. And before long, you'll be tired and you'll not be, do, you'll not be able to do several things that you need to do. But if you start your business, you'll have time in your hands. You control everything that you do. Now, the Holy Spirit is telling you all these things. You're hearing them. But there are some people who say, <laughs> at the end of the day, a bed in hand is what then in the forest. This one, I'm going to get $5,000 at the end of 30 days. Ah, then I tell you, I say, okay, I know what to do. I work for six months. After I work for six months, I now calculate five times six. You know, ah, $30,000. Wow. What will I do with $30,000? Then I'll now resign and start my business. And then they figure, they think they have it all figured out. And then they choose that one and life starts. And at the end of the day, they paid them their $5,000. They're excited. They're, they are so excited. Now remember their calculation. At the end of six months, they will have what? $30,000. That's their calculation. Now they earn the first $5,000. And they're happy, happy in their happiness. Before they know what's happening in two weeks, they have spent like $3,000. It's the truth. They have spent $3,000. But guess what? They are still telling themselves in their mind, in six months, I will have $30,000. I will resign. Second month, the same thing. By the second month, their spending nature has increased. By the end of the second month, they realize that they spent $4,000. Because your appetite will increase. Your association will increase. Here you were before, the shoe, the highest shoe you have, you bought it for 5,000 there. Only you will carry that same shoe and get to the office and one day you just sit there and look at everybody's shoe. You know, I say, where do you buy your shoe? I buy it in so, so more. Oh, really? Oh, okay. It's nice, it's nice. You look at your own, now you start hiding your shoe. Then one day, you now go to that mall that that person mentioned and go and check. And you see the shoe. 180,000 naira. Say, ah, for one shoe. Not to me. Ah, never, never. And then you go back home. Next morning, you're dressing to work. You now wear that your shoe. You now look at the shoe. That's the day you now hear. They that are wearing those, do they have two heads? Then you will tell yourself that the Holy Spirit now asked me. Those that wear those good shoes, do they have two heads? That's what you will say. And then you will gladly go to that shop, chest out, pay that 180,000 naira, wear the shoe and say, yes! Carry it back. Meanwhile, what was your plan? In six months, I will have $30,000. Then I will resign. You continue like that and continue like that. That's how it is now. Now, the moment you bought that first one, in a short while, you will now need to buy the red one and the blue one and the black one. And you understand what I'm saying? 180,000 each. You will now see how easy it is to buy shoe of 180,000. It's so easy. What was doing me before? At the end of six months, you realize that you left all the savings you could gather was maybe $4,000. I said, ah, I said in six months I'll resign. No, no, no. I was only trying to set the foundation of my life. Let me give myself one year. One year. But the Holy Spirit had told you from the beginning that if you go in this path, you will be roped. Now, you don't see that happening. Before you know what's happening, you've done five years. Are you getting what I'm saying? You've done five years. Everybody sees you're making money, but only you know you're dying inside you. Because you know in your heart, there's something else you're supposed to be doing that you're not doing. Now your life, now, you, now you're living in fear. Resign. Hey, now your monthly budget, your monthly budget now is like three and three thousand five hundred dollars. That is what it takes to sustain everything you do monthly. And God now tells you, when you're ready, resign. You, you'd be cracking your head. If I resign now, how will I sustain this lifestyle? You see what the Lord told you from the beginning? 
that you will get trapped. He was telling you you will get trapped, not because the money is not good. He was telling you you will get trapped because a day will come where there will be a conflict and you will be so trapped in that lifestyle that to step out, the rich young ruler, the man loved God. Are you following me? He loved God. He kept, he has kept, he confessed to Jesus that all these laws I have kept. And Jesus said, you lack one thing. Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, then come and follow me. Remember, he carried his own leg to come to Jesus. Are you listening to what I'm saying? He carried his leg and came to Jesus. And he was the one that he didn't say, Lord, how can I multiply my finances? That's not what he asked Jesus. What did he ask Jesus? What must I? Notice, what must I do so that I will have eternal life? So meaning it was biting him inside that look, life is beyond money. Life is beyond all this thing. I'm supposed to have eternal life. He knew it. So when he, he, he observed the teachings of Jesus and it connected with the things that he has been hearing inside of him. So he carried himself and he came, let me be bold, let me ask him. And he asked Jesus and Jesus said, go sell everything you have, give to the poor and come and follow me. The guy looked at what he had. He looked at what it would take to sustain him. He looked at this is eternal life that he seeks. He shook his head. I said, not now. It's the same thing that happens to a lot of people. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit was there from the beginning. He was giving you counsel. But you rejected his counsel. You went for silver. Praise God. Two verses, then we stop. Next verse. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that one may desire cannot be compared to her. Go on. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find out knowledge and discretion. See, this is more. When he says, I dwell with prudence, see, 10 years, you will look back at your life and you will be glad you took the decisions you took. That's what I'm saying. Prudence, I will take you through the process, precept upon precept, line upon line. You will look back and you say, this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm glad. In that state, you'll see people that have money on. In that state, you'll see people who seem like they've gone ahead of you. There are people who, maybe when they were young, their mates were rushing to get married. And they were like, ah, I want to marry, I want to marry, I want to marry. And for some reason, God kept them. I've met people like that. And now they've grown and they are now, those people that will rush to get married are now coming to them and can you imagine what my husband is doing to me? Can you imagine? Ah, he's like, hey? You don't understand. You don't understand. See this marriage thing? It's just calm. <laughs> you don't understand. I've met one, you know, someone was telling, was just telling me, say, Pastor, do you know, when I was much younger, I, I, in fact, just a few years ago, I was just like, God, why am I not married? Why am I not married? Now, nah, I'm wondering if I actually want to. I said, why? He said, ah. I started counting. Almost all my friends, the story is the same. So I'm beginning to believe that is this thing worth it at all? I said, it's worth it too. <laughs> you see, because there is a path that if you don't follow it, you won't get it right. And that's the path the Holy Spirit is. The path of wisdom. To know the difference between good and evil. And the truth is this. If you choose him to start it, it will take him to sustain it. So that thing that you always tell yourself, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. You're hearing wisdom. 
Match break. Match break. No, I know what I'm doing. The problem is, you will now want him to come in the middle to help you figure out what to do. Have you seen people like that before? But he can't. Because if he really wants to step in now, he'll tell you, let's go back to the beginning. And you can't. Just like the example I gave about the job. When you're not crying for God, I don't know, I feel unsatisfied. Yeah, I have money, but I feel unsatisfied. Are you ready to resign? Now? Hey, no, 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 no. No. Lord, there's a way, there's a way, there must be a way. Lord, you just have to do it somehow. Give me peace, give me peace. Ah, ah. You do another three years. You, you come to him again and say, are you ready to resign? Now? No, 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 no. Lord, but there is a way. You have to give me peace. You have to give me peace. You have to give me peace. You do another three years. Now you've done nine years. And you still come to him. Are you ready to resign? <laughs> His answer will be the same. He will not adjust his agenda because of you. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Now, that's why he begins from the beginning to give you counsel. When you hear his counsel, he say, take it. Stand up on your feet. Listen, as God's children, one thing we must never be found in is that we make wrong decisions in life. Wisdom is always there. Wisdom is always standing there. If you listen, you will hear him. But if you decide to follow the crowd, if you decide to follow the crowd, a lady was getting married. Cool, normal lady. I mean, this guy proposed to her. Everything was fine. You know, ah, just normal person. And then they were now planning their marriage. And friends began to talk to her. Ah, your wedding gown must be, you know, this. The hall must be this. This one must be this. This one must be that. Eh, can't you see this person's wedding? Can't you see this person's wedding? Open social media. See, can't, can't you see how glamorous? Now she's thinking all those thoughts and imagining herself walking down and, and fireworks and everything. And then she goes to the guy and say, Ah, bros, I would like this thing, you know. And the guy is wondering, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? How much is it? Uh, uh, the, actually, I want us to use that hole. How much is the hole? 1.2 million. How much is uncle's salary? 200k. You know, we can believe God. Now we can believe God. We can believe God. And the guy started stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching. Put his hands into things and he was able to afford the wedding. But guess what? After that wedding, he realized he didn't know his wife again. He didn't know her again. Because he's wondering, the person I toasted, the person I knew in the seasons where we were cutting, doesn't make this kind of demands. Because you know how it works. No, it's just the wedding, it's just the wedding. After those kind of glamorous wedding, you now go back to that small house. That you plan to, you now say, ah, this house is not, it doesn't be fit. You know, because now my friends that attended my wedding will now come and visit us and see the kind of place. Ah, it will now be as though, hey, no, 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 no. Let's move to a bigger house. Let's move to a bigger house. It continues. Are you hearing me? It continues. But there was wisdom there. There was wisdom for the guy to say, hey, we are not doing that. You see that we go with what we planned before or we leave it. That wisdom was there. But he said, ah, ah. They say you have to please the woman. Yeah, let me please her. 
Are you listening to what I'm saying? Every point of decision in your life, wisdom is there. The Holy Spirit is there. The question, do you hear him? Do you obey him? Lift up your hands and make a commitment to the Lord now. Say, Lord, I will not let a day go by without making this commitment to you. I will listen to you. I will obey you. Your words are right. Your steps are always accurate. You never lead in the wrong way. I will follow you. Anywhere you lead me to. When I lie down, I want to hear you speak to me. When I wake up, I want to hear you speak to me. Let me tell you something. One of the ways that you know you're stepping out of wisdom is when you are sure this thing is not clear to you. Are you listening to me? But it's enticing. When you catch yourself telling yourself that, eh, somehow it will work out. That's the moment you know that you're not walking by the wisdom of God. God, does, God will never do to you somehow it will work out. He will explain to you how it will work out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, the explanation may not make sense to normal men. Are you getting what I'm telling you? The explanation will never make sense to normal men. But it will make sense to you. So when you, that is supposed to make sense to, now live in that realm that is not making sense to you and you're still going ahead, you know you've stepped out of the wisdom of God. And when we get to that bridge, we'll cross it. Most times he tells you how to cross the bridge. He tells you. When I was to marry my wife, I've told you this story many times. We didn't have money. There was no money. But God told me the date of the wedding. Now, he told me the date, so the wedding makes sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I know that I'm supposed to get married. Told me the date, told me the place we'll get married. And told me what will happen on that day. He told me on that day, in the night, there shall be a full moon. He told me that. It's God. So I was very sure we we're walking in the right direction. But there was no money. So all these things he said, I've accepted the date. By the time we went to check, the venue he told me. By the time we went to check, we realized that the venue was free. So we didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> So uh, it was not making sense. Are you getting what I'm saying? Okay, we've got in venue. But that was all. Then I went before the Lord. Listen. I said, okay, Lord. How do we get the money to fix this whole thing? And he told me, he explained so. He said, both of you, put your tithes together. And go and give it to Susan and Superstar. Now you're planning wedding. You expect people to give you money. Not to you for you to carry money and go and give to. Are you getting what I'm saying? But when he said that to me, it made sense. I told her, I said, I know how we're going to get the money. <laughs> he said, how? He said, do you have tight with you? Bring it. See what the Lord told me. And we did and we obeyed. And two days after we did that, the doors began to open. Money began to come. He explained it. But the explanation will not make sense to normal people. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You go and tell someone, say, I know how, I know I'm going to get money to do that thing. He say, okay, how are you going to get money? 
I will give my tithe. I will calculate my tithe of all these things, and then I will give it. Because we'll be looking at you, like, are you are you making sense? But to you, it makes sense. Are you getting what I'm saying? And when the Lord told me that, I had enough sense to know that if this is how we will do the wedding, this is how we will be sustained. I knew. So you can't come and tell me, you can't come and tell me nonsense about tithing. I just look at you like this. You don't know where we're coming from. Never done a business. Never worked for pay. And you understand what I'm saying? My wife and I, we've never done any job to say, here is your payment. We've never done, <laughs> but we have not lacked anything. Because he explained to us and it made sense. Wisdom is always there. Your job is to hear him and follow him. Father, I pray for your word and everyone here. Holy Spirit, by the truth of this message, I pray. No one hearing the sound of my voice will go in the wrong turn in their lives. I pray, Lord, that by this word, you will remove the stony heart and make every heart here in me a heart of flesh that will respond to your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Praise God.